Are you ready for some teaching tonight? Luke 17. Luke 17. I'm glad my bishop made it home. He was traveling all over the south trying to get home and made it home way too early this morning. Pray God gives him strength. While you bookmark Luke 17, 2 Corinthians 2. We're going to be in Luke 17 and 2 Corinthians 2. I was praying Sunday night with my wife. I mean, it's kind of become a joke to me and my wife. I I actually thought I was going to teach Godhead part two. (laughs) Yeah, that was in the fall. (laughs) And God just dropped this in my spirit on Sunday night. Luke said, said to his disciples, I'm in the Amplified, stumbling blocks, temptations and traps set to lure one to sin are sure to come. But woe, judgment is coming to him through whom they come. He said, traps are going to come. Stumbling blocks, your translation may say offenses will come. And we need to beware of them. But he said, judgment's coming to the one who they come through. 2 Corinthians 2, verse number 10 and 11. Paul has just got done describing what he wants to see as a restoration process who most scholars believe was a man who openly attacked his spiritual authority in the body. And Paul said, enough is enough. Restore this brother. He said, now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed, I'm getting some feedback up here, by the way. For if indeed I've forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. That means he was in the presence of God praying, and he forgave this brother. Verse 11, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. I'm going to teach tonight on forgiveness, the healing balm of the body. It's going to be a bad night for the devil. Paul linked in that scripture a lack of forgiveness to Satan taking advantage. Would you lift your hands and pray with me tonight? Jesus, God, I know I've heard from you. Pray, Lord, that you would help me deliver this in the spirit of love. Just like you would, Lord, because you're the great shepherd. God, this is something that every one of us deal with. I pray that ears would be open, spirits would be open, God. More importantly, Lord, than hearing it and even studying it, let us live it. Let us walk in it, God, in Jesus' name. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. One of these things will come in your path, and one of these things has already come in your path. Number one, you will perceive, this is a good night for taking notes, by the way, you will perceive that you've been mistreated or wronged. Number two, you will unintentionally be mistreated or be wronged. Or number three, somebody is going to intentionally mistreat you or wrong you. Has anyone in here never been mistreated? Has anyone in here never had the perception 
that you have been mistreated. That's what I thought, because we are all human beings who interacted with other human beings. By the way, in my experience of ministry, in, even in the business world, it's usually number one or number two. Usually you are perceiving someone mistreated you, or someone that did mistreat you didn't do it on purpose. But why do we always feel like it's number three? This person doesn't like me. This person hates me. This person likes so-and-so more. Isn't that how it is? I can't believe they invited this person and not this person. I can't believe that they told me this. I can't believe they said this about me to somebody else. Has that ever happened to you? No matter what category of those, there's only one common remedy. And I'm here to tell you, it is not to pray through. It is not to get over it. It is to forgive that person. It's going to be tight for a little while. Because I'm just going to be very honest with you. Elder Williams, I was praying on Sunday night. It's so easy to forget spiritual disciplines. It's so easy to forget things God's told us to do already. I was praying on Sunday night, and I was praying about people that I know are offended at me. I was disturbed in my spirit about situations or were offended at my wife. I was disturbed in my spirit, and I was praying, and I was praying, and the Lord smacked me upside the head and said, you need to forgive them for their offense at you. And you need to pray for them. I know. We're not preaching about Jericho's walls tonight. God said you need to forgive them for their, how, how they're treating you as a response to what they perceive or what you did to them. Because offense and unforgiveness is a vicious cycle. It doesn't stop. You've, we've got to be real tonight. When you find out somebody is offended at you, your natural response is, be offended at them. <laughs> Am I, do I have any real human beings in the audience here tonight? How dare they be offended at me? Now I'm offended at them. That's your flesh. That is your flesh. But we're going to talk about that. Repeatedly. We've even... God gave us a tool to work through differences and conflicts. God gave us a tool. God gave us a balm, if you will, to heal fractures in the body of Christ. Repeatedly in the instructional letters to the church and in the gospels, God is repeatedly telling us this. Let's go to Colossians 3, verses 12 through 13. I'm in the Amplified. So as God's own chosen people, who are holy, set apart, sanctified for His purpose, and well-beloved by God Himself. We love that part. Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, which has the power to endure, uh-oh, whatever injustice or unpleasantness comes with good Temper, that means with self-control. Bearing graciously with one another and willingly forgiving each other if one has a cause for complaint against another. Oh no, now he's, Paul's about to step it up a whole nother level. Just, that means in the same way that the Lord has forgiven you so you 
should forgive. The message really captures in verse 13 the tone and urgency. Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. That's what the Greek language is saying. It's, it's not when I get around to it, when enough time has passed that I'm kind of over it a little bit, and then I'll kind of forgive them. Be quick to forgive an offense. Oh, forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Along with all malice, be kind to one another, tender-hearted. But I, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of insert this here, okay? But when you're not kind to one another, when you're not tender-hearted with one another, when somebody messes up in how they address you, how they talk to you, how they look at you, how they snub you, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. I'm going to read verse 32 in the Amplified. Be kind and helpful to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely. That means I'm not waiting on you to do something nice for me, elder, before I forgive you. I'm giving forgiveness freely. Why? Because when I was in the middle of my iniquity, he hung on a cross. Just as God in Christ forgave you. So notice he, now he's differentiating. He's not just saying, just as God forgave you. Remember what God did when he was on this earth walking? Remember that beating he took? Remember that scourging he took? Remember those, 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 those nails he took? Remember the, 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 the flesh that was ripped from his body? Remember that crown of thorns? Remember that death, that mocking, that, that, that scorning he received? Oh yeah, the same way. I want you to forgive each other. Jesus told you in Matthew 6, 9 through 15, in this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. As, that is to say, in the same manner as we forgive our debtors. And don't lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And then as if Jesus was finishing telling the pattern of prayer, he did not expound upon, hallowed be thy name. He didn't expound on your kingdom come, your will be done. He didn't expound upon daily bread. He expounded on forgiving. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. But you don't know what they did to me, Lord. You don't know what they said. And we're going we're gonna to talk about this because... There are some people in here that you're in, you, were, you were greatly, greatly wronged even a long time ago. And it has affected and filtered how you respond to everything. And I'm going to tell you, the reason is not because you just haven't been healed yet. The reason is not just because enough time hasn't passed that you just got over it. The reason you haven't been healed is because you haven't forgiven that person. Oh, just a wall just went up, elder. A wall just went, but you don't know what they did to me. They cheated on me. Yes, I said it. They abused me. They raped me. They beat me. Yes. Yes, they did. And until you forgive that person, 
you will carry that scar, that wound, that pain. You will carry that action to the grave. They left our family. They betrayed our family. Yes, they did. They absolutely did. And you know what the crazy thing is about the offender and the abuser? They're out there living their best life. They don't care. They don't care that you're offended. I'm going to tell you something. I had a conversation with an individual many, many years ago that went back to way back when I was a kid that this person wronged me in my family. They wronged me. And you know what this person told me? This, this happened so long ago. Get over it. <laughs> Easy for them to say. Easy for them to say, get over it. They're the ones that did it. They're not carrying it. You're the one with the scar. You're the one with the wound. You're the one with the pain. You're the one carrying that thing. They're not carrying it. Thank you. That is good teaching. Because that's what happens. So you're out there. You're, you're tightened up. You're clamored up. You can't You can't function. There's people right now, you can't listen to what I'm saying because you're offended at me. I've seen it. I looked at you three times. You keep turning your eyes. You're offended. So you're losing out on the word of God because you're offended at me. Brother Jersey, I've been there, bro. He's not the guy, by the way. <laughs> He's been locked in with me. I've been here 10 years I've been back. My pastor is also my father-in-law. You think I haven't walked in here with family problems? You think I haven't walked in here? You think I haven't walked in here with him having gently whooped my hide ministerially? And I've been offended and have, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Listen, I have missed out on his anointing teaching because I didn't release what he said to me. That's real talk. I'm just right down where I'm just right down where we live. We can even be offended when the person did something right. We just didn't want to hear it. But until you get to that understanding, because your flesh is so deceitful, until you get to that understanding, you are perceiving that you've been mistreated. So I'm telling you, the secret is, even when you perceive they've done you wrong, you need to find a prayer closet and you need to forgive them. Well, I can forgive them. How many of you heard this? I can forgive them, but I'm not going to be friends with them. I'm not going to be BFFs with them. I'm not going to break bread with them. I, I'm, not going to, we're, I'm never going to trust them again. We forgive, but we don't. I'll never give them that access. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord... How often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Peter was just like most of us. How many times do I got to do it, Lord, before I cut him off? How many times do I have to hear it before I get to switch churches? How many times before I get to switch elders? How many times before I switch marriages? Thank you. How many times? How many times until I don't have to work with that person anymore? Notice he didn't say my neighbor or my enemy. He said my brother. As many as seven times, Jesus said. I don't say to you seven, but 77 times. <laughs> that just means multiple completeness. Seven is the number of perfection. He just said, keep on doing it. But then he didn't stop. He said, therefore, the kingdom of heaven 
may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. That was a lot of money. I, I didn't look up the equivalent, but it was like millions of dollars. And since he could not pay, listen, the servant could not pay the debt. His master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had in payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I'll pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master released him, forgave his debt. He didn't lower his debt. He erased it. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants. Someone who's in the same boat as him owed him a hundred denarii. Seizing him, began to choke him. Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down, pleaded with him. Have patience with me. I'll pay you. Same spirit as the first guy. Right. To the guy who just got forgiven. Right. He refused and went, put him in prison till he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to the master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me and should not, mm, the Lord just showed me something, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Notice, he pleaded with him. He pleaded with the master. He was desperate to be forgiven his own. People like that always want their own offenses excused. They never take blame for anything. It's everybody, but if you, if you just do something sideways, yo, buddy, you're on the bad, you're on the hit list for a long time. Notice he didn't just say, I forgive you. I know you did that. I forgive you. No, he said, it has to come from here. I have had people actually tell me, and I probably deserved it at the time. They actually told me, I forgive you because I have to. I forgive you because if I don't forgive you, I, God won't forgive me. You didn't forgive them. Because it didn't come from your heart, it came from duty, it came from your head. Oh, I have to do this, so I better check this box. We need to understand that when you've been wronged, you can't ever remove the wrong except through forgiveness. You can't remove it. If I wrong you, elder... If I wrong you, if I go to your, your son, if he comes to me and he tells me, he tells me something and he's navigating something and I say, man, your, your, your dad, he just, he's off on this. You know why? This is because this is how he is. And, and I talk about you behind your back. Mm -hmm. I can do a hundred positive acts in response, but I still haven't removed the wrong. The only way to remove the wrong is forgiveness. That's it. And in our flesh, we will look for a hundred different ways to try and rectify situations and reconcile situations, except for the only one that God repeatedly tells us to do, which is forgive your brother, forgive your sister. Show me an offended, bitter person, and you've shown me an unforgiving person. Show me an unforgiving person, and you've shown me someone who's lost view of God's mercy and their own sinfulness. Whenever I hold on, it's, and church, it's so easy to do. You don't even have to try. In fact, just don't do anything, and that will start 
that'll just creep up because it's flesh. Flesh just need, means, when flesh, carnal, that just means the natural person. That means who we are without God. So if that flesh does not go on an altar, if that flesh does not go in the word, if that flesh does not get subjected to the spirit, unforgiveness will run rampant in my life. We need to have forgiveness. Let me tell you where we need to have forgiveness. We need to have forgiveness in our families. I'm going to tell you five of the most powerful words that go together in any relationship. Ready? It's going to blow your mind. The first two are, I'm sorry. The following three are, I forgive you. Ooh, it's quiet in here. Jesus said to Peter, Peter said, if my brother messes up and he comes and repents, if he comes to you, it comes to me and says, I messed up. I mistreated you. I felt this way about you. I, I, I was wrong about my perception about you. He's saying, I'm sorry. I messed it up and I'm going to do differently this time. I'm sorry are two of the most powerful words in any relationship. Are you willing to say, I was wrong? Are you in response willing to say, I forgive you? I forgive you? I'm going to tell you, if that's not in your marriage, That license might still be hanging in a frame somewhere, but it's not living in the richness that it's supposed to. We need to be quick to be able to say, husbands and wives, we need to be quick to acknowledge our wrongs and forgive the wrongs of our spouses. We have to. Because you say, oh, I just get on, I'll just get over it. We'll just move. Too many people... Just move on like nothing happened. And they never resolve conflict. They just, the next day, we're just talking like nothing happened. Except it happened. And so you're acting like nothing happened. You both know something happened. And you carry that for years. Parents and kids. You need to be willing to say, I'm sorry. And you need to be willing to forgive. Because all this conflict and all this animosity and resentment towards people in our own families. Because we're not humble enough to forgive each other. We're not humble enough to say, I messed it up. I messed it up. I did it. I'm not going to pull a Adam. Her fault. I did that for years. Most of my marriage has been not taking responsibility. Most of my 15 years, I did not take responsibility for things that I was wrong in. Well, guess what? She carries that. That affects and forms somebody in a relationship. And I'm talking, I'm in the Holy Ghost right now. There are marriages, there's been no resolution for years on things. There's been things that happened 20 years ago. There still has not been healing. There hasn't been forgiveness. Kids with parents holding things against parents, holding things against kids that happened years ago. Because you haven't forgiven you have to forgive even when there's no, you're never going to get that apology. I'm here, I got to tell somebody in the spirit, you're never going to get that apology you keep waiting for. Because some of it, you're still holding on to stuff, they're dead. They're gone. You got to find a place in the spirit. And say, God, I forgive them. And this is what forgiveness sounds like. God, 
I don't hold it against them, and I don't want you to hold it against them. Lift your hands for just a moment. Lord, you're plowing deep tonight. I feel the confirmation of your word. God, help me to remember who I am without you. And to so easily that hundred denarii. We're going to need forgiveness in the church. We're going to need it between brothers and sisters. Hold on, now it's about to get real. Followers must learn to forgive their leaders. In every capacity. If you're in jam, you're going to have to learn to forgive that jam leader. And you're going to have to learn to forgive Sister Tamika. If you're in worship, you're going to have to learn to forgive the person that's leading worship that night and didn't do it the way you liked or may have corrected you or may have, may have done something that you didn't like. Oh, it's way too real in here right now. You're going to have to learn to forgive your elder. I have to forgive my bishop. You want to know why? This is the easiest target in the whole house. Can you believe he said that? Can you believe they did that today? Because it's a glass house. Our mistakes are in front of everybody. Yours are behind closed doors. Your leader has to address things in whatever department you're in. And if you don't like it, you better learn to forgive right quick or you're going to get bitter. It's true. It's just true. You want to know why? Because that leader is a human being. Guess what? I have bad days just like you do. I have carnal days just like you do. I have days I'm going through things just like you do. But if I don't respond wrong, if I respond wrong, it's in front of people. So my mistake's out in the open. I'm asking you to forgive me. Because guess what? There's days I'm going through it too. There's days my marriage is going through it too. There's days my work is going through it too. We need your forgiveness Forgive your Bible study teacher. Forgive your media leader. I'm serious. Guess what, leaders? You better learn to forgive your followers. Thank you, brother. If you're a leader, you better learn how to forgive those because they're we don't always follow right. I'm still figuring out how to follow, let alone I'm leading at the same time. Mm -hmm. There's people, they lie right to my face. There's people tell me, tell me what you want me to do, elder. Okay, here's what I want you to do. They do the exact opposite. (laughs) Listen, listen to me. If you can't learn to deal with being mistreated and wronged by people, don't get into the ministry. Unforgiveness will kill your ministry. Because Jesus led the example. (laughs) Jesus, I want to be like Jesus. You sure? Leaders must forgive fellow leaders. I'm telling you, brother, I'd be much rather preaching about how Jesus is the mighty God in Christ. Interdepartmentally, I'm going to tell you something. I've already used it as an example. He's used it. You don't understand how different me and this brother are. How different we are in appearance. (laughs) 
Our personalities are about that different, aren't they? Come on, I love you. <laughs> Don't he look good? He been hitting that gym. I'm going to tell you something. Me and Elder Manley, we go way back. We don't always agree on ministry. Me and Bishop, oh, you don't, y'all don't even know our history. Some of the people in here are like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Elder Manley. We don't always agree. There's ways I have responded to him that were wrong. I've got to learn to say, you know what? That's my brother. We may, we may not, but, but, but I'm going to forgive him because he's going through it just like I am. This will not be a wedge. We've got to, every time there is a mistreatment, every time there is something that happens, listen, it happens. I'm not up here saying mistreatment doesn't happen. It does happen. What you gonna do when it does? What if the person on the other side has too much pride to say, I'm sorry, I messed it up? What are you gonna do? I'm going to tell you myself personally, and I recommend it for everyone. I, I am maybe over, over the top, but I can look at hyphen members that I have come to you and I have said, I missed it. This don't give me perfection. There's some brothers in here, multiple times I've come to you. Tony, Ben, Chris, Miguel, multiple times I've said, I didn't handle this right. I'm sorry. I jumped the gun. I perceived you did something that, guess what, you didn't do. I got egg on my face, and I'm the pastor. Will you forgive me? Because God resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. I don't want somebody else to miss out on heaven because I missed it. And I don't want somebody to miss out on, on heaven and God's blessing in their life and God's calling on their life because they're offended at me. I don't. So I say, God, release it. Don't, don't hold it to their account. Don't do it. I don't care who was right. It's our problem. We're too worried about who was right. Jesus wasn't worried about who was right. He kept his mouth shut and let him hit him and pull his beard out and put the thorns on his head and put the back, his back open. He opened not his mouth. I felt like the Lord showed me something in the scripture. Jesus in John 14, 30 and 31 says, I will no longer talk much with you. For the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. No grounds for any accusation. That's what that means. No claim means there's no grounds. There's nowhere for him to say, oh yeah, oh he's got lust there. He's got pride there. He's got offense there. He's got, there was nothing in there, right? But I do as the Father's commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. Satan was coming for him, right? The ruler of this world, he's Satan. When he said this, where was Satan? John 13, 26 and 27, Jesus answered, 
It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon. Now after this piece of bread, Satan entered him. When Jesus said that final words, he said, the ruler of the world is coming. There's nothing in me for him to grab. When Judas arrived, Jesus was already prepared to receive betrayal from a brother and from a student. There was nothing in him. There was no grounds for accusation in Jesus. Satan did not just come to kill him. He laid a trap by coming in the form of his brother and his student. This man had been poured into by Jesus for over three years. Jesus said, the ruler of this world is coming. And up walks Judas. I'm here to tell you, Jesus had already dealt with the potential offense in the garden. He had already prepared and said, I believe this. The scripture doesn't say this, but I believe this. That he had already pardoned Judas. Because he said, when he comes, there's nothing in me. I'm already prepared. I already know he's coming. I already know that he's going to have, he's messed it up. Oh, by the way, greetings, friend. Hear this. Connect that with what Peter told Jesus and what Jesus told Peter about how many times we forgive. Oh, I don't have to be their bestie. I don't have to be their friend. Yes, you do. Oh, see, I I don't like that either. How are you going to forgive somebody 77 times unless there's access If you cut off access, you just forgive them once and they're out of your life. And that's how some of us have been dealing with relationships for years. But he said, forgive them. Now, if they gave you $100, if you gave them $100 and, and, or they stole $100, are you supposed to lay $100 out in front of a man? No. Trust is earned. But you're also supposed to be able to go out to eat with them. You're supposed to be able to go up to them in the house of God, hug their neck with sincerity and say, I love you. I'm praying for you. I want God's best in your life. See, our flesh tells us what we get to do with forgiveness. But the Bible tells us what forgiveness really is. How do you know that, elder? How can you say that? Well, we're supposed to love each other. In fact, the sign of the church to the world is not miracles, signs, and wonders. The the, the sign of the church to the world is not holiness. The sign of the church to the world is not how great our worship is. It's our love one for another. Hang on. First Corinthians 13, 5. Love is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not provoked, nor overly sensitive and easily angered. It does not take into account a wrong endured. The NIV says, In that verse, it keeps no record of wrongs. And that's our problem. We keep a record. Some of us, it's in our marriages. You did this, you always do this, you've been doing this for 20 years. It's a record. It's a record. You always do that. You always say it like that. You always, our brothers, 
They did, well, well, in 2023, they did this, but then in 2022, they did this. Then in 2020, see, you remember every time somebody wronged you, but you can't remember what Bishop preached last week. Andale, andale. That's real. You remember, you can tell exactly how they did it. You want to know why? You got a big whiteboard in the spirit, and you wrote down every, how they said it, what they did, and it's right there. But the problem is everywhere you go, you're dragging that thing with you, whether you realize it or not. It's weighing you down. I'm going to tell you just this small thing on Sunday when I started praying. My whole spirit switch just like that when I released it and when I began praying blessing upon that person it's hard to be offended or upset with somebody when you're praying for them Jesus said but I say to you love your enemies bless those who curse you do good to those who hate you pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you how much more for a brother and a sister they're trying to make it in the kingdom just like you are. They're going through things just like you are. That's, you know what the problem is? We hate ourselves. We hate our flesh. We project it on other people. That's why you'll get more upset and disturbed about something that happens to a little Bambi than a busload of people that crash and die in a fire. Say it a little louder. Because that thing was innocent. But you know those people? Man, they probably deserved it. They don't care. We project on ourselves. Brother Stone King did one of the greatest setups I've ever seen in camp meeting 95 or 96. He told this awful story about this dog, this pitiful stray dog that was brutally killed by a group of construction workers. You could hear the groans in the audience. And he said, you're such hypocrites. He said, I tell a story like that, and there's groans and moans. He said, I could preach a, a message about hell, and none of you would move. Because we project. We know who we are. We know what people are. That's why when Christ came, it had never been heard before. It was revolutionary. We've heard it because we grew up with it. But when he said, you have heard an eye for an eye. But I say unto you, when they slap you, turn the other cheek. When they tell you to go a mile, you go two. Nobody had ever heard that before. His concept of forgiveness. And he said, I want it in the church because guess what? You are going to mess it up. <laughs> I'm going to mess it up. He said, but here's the healing balm. It's called forgiveness. I forgave you, and that forgiveness that's in you, you get to let it flow out to others. It liberates them, and it liberates me. But here's the real problem. Unforgiving and offended people, they don't view themselves as offended. The Lord hit me with that. I'm preparing this message. He said, you need to put this in. Offended people don't view themselves as offended. And I was like, whoa. That's true. Because guess what? When I'm offended, I don't view myself as offended. When I'm bitter, I don't view myself as bitter. I view myself as justified. I view my bitterness as the proper proportional response for their perceived wrongs. I view my pain as their mistreatment. And the other telltale sign is blame. I'm this way because of what they did. Is that what Jesus did for you? I'm going to tell us this in love. If I have to forgive out of duty, I haven't visited the cross in a while. I've lost sight. I haven't pleaded with the master in a while. Because when, oh, y'all don't understand. When I remember who I was, pfft, 
I say, God, don't lay anything. Don't lay anything to their charge. Put it on me if you have to, but let it go. I don't want it. I don't want it on any record. Don't do it. Romans 12, 17 through 19 says, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do all that is honorable in the sight of all, if possible, so far as it depends on you, not on them, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. By the way, that doesn't mean God's lightning bolt. That means God's just justice. For as it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And you know my dear friend, Brother Halsman, told me something he's told me so many times. Brother, do you want to fight that battle or do you want God to fight that battle? Do you want to get justice or you want God to get that justice? Do you want to weigh it in? Do you want to judge? And he has checked my spirit so many times and said, you're wrong, brother. You need a friend like that. He says, you need to forgive. You need to find a place of repentance, not, you're right. They did do you wrong. You need to get out. You need to go, you need to go get even with them. You need to tell them how a T.I. is. You need to go ahead and just let them know. That's not Christ. Forgiveness is what heals the fractures and the wounds that happen because we're just people. You know what I realize in the church? And I realize my time is up. We got 200 people in the church, plus something like that. It took me a while to realize, Elder Stokes, there's always going to be people in here that are backslidden on a pew. There's always going to be people that are new. There's always going to be people that are growing. There's always going to be people that are mature, people that are immature, going through restoration, going through all kinds. Guess what? That means there's, there's always going to be people on these pews at every walk with God. Somebody is going to mess it up. Never in 2,000 years have the whole body of Christ walked into the church building walking in the spirit. <laughs> Not once. So when I'm having an off day, and you're having an off day, and we're still growing and we're still learning, guess what we're going to do? We're going to forgive each other. Forgiveness allows us to move past our flesh response and embrace a God response, which draws God closer. Because you know as well as I do, when we're bitter, see, you can have joy of the Lord and sorrow at the same time, but you cannot have joy of the Lord and bitterness at the same time. Because bitterness doesn't come from God. Unforgiveness does not come from God. Frustration and anger that we're holding at someone else does not come from God. It's a fruit of the flesh. That's right before the fruit of the Spirit, by the way. All you got to do is read it and go, which one is better yet? Ask your spouse, which one am I walking in? Ask your parent, ask your kids. Oh, if you dare. Forgiveness embraces God. Hebrews 12, 14 through 15. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. What is this root of bitterness? I decided to study it because I always just thought it was, well, it's the root of someone's bitter at somebody else, but it's not. The writer of Hebrews is quoting Deuteronomy 29, verses 18 and 19. Beware, lest there be among you a man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart is turning away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. Beware, lest there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. One who, when he hears the words of this sworn covenant, blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my own heart. The root is when we hear a message and we say, no, 
I'm not going to do that. I'm going to continue in my own little relationship with God. I'm going to continue and do my own little thing, and I'm going to walk with God. Except, guess what? You're not walking with God. Because after all those scriptures that talk about forgiveness, we still say, no, I'm not going to do that. That's the fulfillment of that scripture. I'm safe. Oh, no. This applies to everyone else but me because what they did to me is an exception to the word. So the problem is a root doesn't just stay there. It digs deeper, and it takes a stronger and stronger hold. The longer it stays, the harder it is to remove, and the more destructive it is to its surroundings. Imagine walking around with unforgiveness. The Lord dropped this in my spirit this afternoon. Imagine walking around with unforgiveness while acting like God has pardoned you while you have not forgiven that brother or sister. I shall be safe, though I walk in the stubbornness of my own heart. But a true, humble act of forgiveness heals the divide, removes the root, and it heals you. Stand with me. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I have been in a lot of services that talked about reconciliation, talked about offense. By the way, this is the answer to offense. They say, here's what you need to do. Go find that brother or sister that you're offended with. That got to be the dumbest idea in in the world. I'm sorry. I mean, y'all been here at rallies where they do that. Go find that person who wronged you in front of the whole church. Oh, yeah, okay. All right. (laughs) Y'all seen it? Go make it right. No, because everyone's like, ooh, oh, oh, I knew there was something. I knew. Oh, my goodness. Oh, thank God they're finally reconciled. They've been arguing for three years. Jesus said, leave your gift at the altar, go do it in private, and solve that thing. But the first thing we need to do is what Paul did. He said, I forgave him in the presence of God. So that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to tell you, there's some of us that might be walking in it, but for most of us, we should not come up here and be like, oh, I don't have anything. I don't struggle with that. If you don't struggle with that, you're not a human being. You've already ascended into glory. I didn't know Jesus came back already. But you need to do it sincerely by revisiting the cross for yourself and then saying, oh, 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 Lord, that, that. I will not keep a record of those wrongs. Because when the Bible says we don't remember It's not just, you can't, you may not be able to forget, but what it's saying is, I'm not going to hold it to your account. Every time we interact, I'm not going to go, oh, I remember what you did to me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No. God, I'm going to release that, and I'm going to love. And we can do that, whether it's up at this, this altar. I want you to come. I want you to find a place of prayer and pray in the Spirit. Just get in the Spirit. This doesn't need to be you crying out loud and saying, oh, God, forgive Brother Gentleman. No. This needs to be, God, I forgive anything anyone's done to me. I release it from their account. I will no longer keep a record of that. God, I know that trust can take time to be built, but forgiveness, God, comes in a moment from the heart. Father, I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus that you would remove the deception and the delusion, God, that comes with unforgiveness. That feeling of being justified, that feeling, Lord, that I'm right and they're wrong. God, that's not, that's not you. That's not your character. That's not what you went to the cross with. God, I know there's people, they may have done it on purpose. 
but God, help me to flip it around. What if I had a perspective that that's my brother? They probably didn't mean that on purpose. They probably didn't mean to harm me. But God, those situations were even if they did. Something was intentional, Lord, in the family. Something was intentional. God, in the body, in that ministry. God, I'm still, I'm going to release it right now. I'm going to, I'm going to forgive it right now. In the name of Jesus, let that spirit of Christ come over us right now, God. God, I know this is plowed deep. I know, Lord, this has hit a lot of sensitive points of life. This has hit a lot of sensitive relationships, God. This is this has hit some tender parts of, of souls that are here, Lord. But we've got to forgive like you did. It's not going to be perfect, God. It's going to be a growth. But Lord, if I have to come every day to that altar and say, God, forgive them for what they did years ago. I forgive them, Lord. I release it. I put it under the blood. Lord, I don't want this to be laid to their account at eternity. God, I don't want this to hinder their walk with God. So let there be a release, God. Forgive them, Lord. They're not perfect. They're growing just like I am. They're praying just like I am. They're fasting just like I am. I am. They're learning just like I am, Lord, so release it. Release it, God, so that we can get into the Spirit the way that we need to. God, I want it to be said of me that there's nothing, there's no claim that Satan has on me. God, I don't want to fall for that trap of unforgiveness. Like Paul said, Lord, God, that if I don't forgive, Satan is waiting to lay a trap because on top of that unforgiveness, all other kinds of things will get into my spirit, Lord. But God, if I keep a clean slate, God, if I love like you love, if I forgive like you forgave, Lord, this body will be stronger. This body will be stronger. This ministry will be stronger. God, this family will be stronger. God, lay the ax to that root of bitterness. Lay the ax to the stubbornness of our hearts, Lord. Every one of us has stubborn hearts, God. There's not a one of us, Lord, that doesn't have pride. There's not a one of us, God, that doesn't have that iniquity of self-will. Every one of us has it, God. But we want that ax to be laid to it tonight, Lord, so that we can be free, so we can walk in the Spirit, Lord, so we can see healing to relationships and healing, oh God, God in the body, Lord, so that there can be harvest. Thank you, Lord. Oh, God, this is, this is life right now. God, somebody's going to get up from this place of prayer forever changed. God, because they've been waiting. They've been waiting for some magic moment of healing. But the reality is, God, it comes in the release of forgiveness. Oh, shandala la 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 boho koshiata la la bahaka.